Hi, and welcome to another edition of From the Woods Today. And you know, Billy, it's tree week, and that's what we're going to celebrate today. Hey, it's a celebratory time. You know, anytime we can talk about trees and how important they are, it's a great thing. And we're delighted to have you all with us today on From the Woods Today. Um, we, we've got urban and community forestry program from the Kentucky Division of Forestry. One of our very own graduates is um, leading that program here in Kentucky. So we'll hear from her um, in a few moments. Uh, we also have a couple of our team members going to be talking about um, how to plant a tree and how to properly care for it once it's in the ground. I think Ellen and Laura are going to be speaking to that. And we have Chad Nyman talking about an exciting week next week, Renee, right. Forest right. Products Week. Right. So right. it's right. Tree Week right. this week. Forest Products Week next week. Yeah, so, tree uh, trees and more trees. I think that's. Yeah. I know, but we are delighted. Here we're going on. <laughs> no, we're delighted to have you all with us today. Um, if you do have any questions and you're on Zoom, please use the chat pod. And if you're on Facebook, um, please use the comment section. Uh, but Renee, I'm glad to have our great presenters with us today and get this show started. Yeah, so let's get going. So, uh, Bridget, if you can come on with us. Wonderful. Great. So, explain a little bit about what your topic is going to be about today. Happily. Um, well, first of all, I just wanted to introduce myself. I am Bridget Abernathy, and I manage the Urban and Community Forestry Program for the state of Kentucky. Um, so I'm just going to give a brief overview about what urban and community forestry is and um, talk about the different facets of community forestry. And then I'm going to give some localized examples of different um, projects and initiatives going on throughout the state. Um, so I'll go ahead and get started. Um, first of all, I wanted uh, to start by telling you a little bit about the Kentucky Division of Forestry. Um, the agency was established in 1912, and it's since grown to about 120 full-time employees. Um, our headquarters office in Frankfurt, we have six field offices scattered throughout the state, and we have two tree nurseries. Brandon Howard is our 16th director of the division, and he serves as the state forester for the agency. There are eight major programs within KDF, and we have some smaller um, sub-programs as well. So I'll start my discussion with a broad overview of urban and community forestry, and we'll finish with some localized examples of some work uh, being carried out throughout the state. Um, KDF's Urban and Community Forestry Program um, is guided by the USDA Forest Service. And this is a federal agency that funds state urban and community forestry programs in all 50 states of the US. So each state in the US has uh, urban forestry staff that's funded by the USDA. And it typically consists of program managers uh, such as myself and then um, some field staff. So Kentucky collaborates um, within the southern region with 13 other states in the southern group of state foresters group um, and that's also includes the virgin islands and puerto rico um, so this collaboration helps to guide the programming here um, in the state but also in the region um, and helps work with multi-state projects and different initiatives so the program structure here in kentucky um, consists of myself, the program manager, and then some of our field staff who work in our six field offices who help support some of this work. So, um, you know, really the goal of the program is to help communities develop long-term self-sustaining urban forestry programs um, and with the end goal of creating healthier, uh, more economically viable, stronger and safer communities throughout Kentucky. So on a local or a community level, this has many different facets and that ranges um, from simple to complex. And um, the work being carried out uh, within my program um, includes managing a grant program, um, supporting different community and partner initiatives, um, carrying out workshops and trainings, helping with tree board development, organizing Arbor Days and other reforestation events, managing uh, Arbor Day Foundation programs such as the Tree City program, and supporting um, my agency staff and assisting the general public. So what encompasses our urban forest? A lot of people um, don't really understand what an urban forest is. So, um, you know, generally speaking, it's all of the trees that are right outside our front doors, um, but they also are dynamic ecosystems that provide critical benefits to our communities. And that comes in many different shapes and sizes. So our urban forests include parks, um, street trees, yard trees, landscape boulevards, 
gardens, rivers, stream corridors, greenways, wetlands, nature preserves, and working trees in former industrial sites. So um, the urban and community forest also contains many other facets, uh, such as wildlife, waterways, built roads and structures, and of course, humans. So what is urban and community forestry? It is the establishment and management of these trees in our communities. Um, and this includes public and private trees um, that help maintain healthy trees for air and water quality benefits, energy savings, environmental health, human health, as well as to enhance the quality of life in our urban residents. And why is urban and community forestry important? Well, more than one half of Kentuckians live in or near an urban setting. So we think generally of an urban setting as being a larger metropolitan area, but uh, an urban setting um, can include some of our small rural towns as well. Um, the population in our towns in Kentucky, um, as well as in other cities throughout the US continues to grow. And um, that makes our urban forest more important um, than ever in our commonwealth. So our urban forestry management decisions really should encompass the environmental, economic, social, and human health benefits that they provide. Um, and urban and community forestry helps create these resilient communities um, in our changing world to help us address different things like increases in population, urban heat island, climate change, extreme weather events, and also natural disasters. So there's a broad spectrum of work under the uh, general umbrella of urban and com community forestry. And this can range from large scale research projects to smaller volunteer driven tree planting events. And this a work occurs in our largest cities, but also in our very small towns throughout Kentucky. So who's doing this work? Well, the work is up by a variety of professionals, um, volunteers and tree enthusiasts. So there are a diversity of groups carrying out this work. Um, and I, I, I've captured you know, some of them on this slide um, but they include some uh, organizations like nonprofit organizations, uh, state and local governments, educational institutions, volunteer groups, local businesses, and dedicated community members. So I wanted to share a sampling of the work taking place around Kentucky um, within different organizations and institutions. Uh, so on the next slides, I will discuss several projects and programs being carried out by um, nonprofit organizations, educational institutions, municipalities, local businesses, and corporate partners. And so this is just really um, a, a, a touch point um, as to, to what is going on in our state. And we have much, much more than the sampling, but I wanted to give a, a nice overview of, of some really great things happening. So uh, for the nonprofit organization spotlight, uh, I wanted to focus on the Northern Kentucky Urban and Community Forestry Council. This is an all volunteer organization that was established over 20 years ago, and it has a focus on increasing tree canopy in the Boone, Kenton and Campbell County area of Northern Kentucky. So this organization has been instrumental in raising awareness about tree planting and tree care through engaging with the public. And for the past 15 years, the council has hosted um, Reforest Northern Kentucky. So this is one of three annual uh, community reforestation events that occur around, around Kentucky. Each year, about 300 volunteers help to plant about 2,000 trees in the Northern Kentucky area. And uh, the Reforest Northern Kentucky has planted hundreds of acres of trees over the years. And the council works to help maintain um, and to protect these sites through different kinds of educational signage, invasive species removal, and volunteer work days. For our higher education institution spotlight, I am focusing on the University of Louisville. Um, the University of Louisville, in collaboration with the Nature Conservancy and many other partners, initiated the Green Heart Project in 2016 um, to test the theory uh, that healthier air makes for healthier people. This project examines the effects of urban greening on human health, um, and it is the first study of its kind. So uh, the research area is made up of parts of four residential neighborhoods in South Louisville and consists of about 22,000 residents. And the study is examining levels of particulate matter behind um, a green buffer or tree planting areas compared to areas with lesser tree canopy. So the Nature Conservancy and a local nonprofit organization called Louisville Grows 
are working on planting nearly 8,000 large trees in the study area. And TMC is also working with an organization in Louisville called Youth Build. It's a local organization um, that is helping to monitor tree health in the study area uh, through the engagement of youth carrying out the work um, after they've been trained. And over five years, Green Heart is comparing pollution levels and health outcomes in the study area and is working with about 700 volunteers. So these people are being regularly tested for baseline health, stress levels, disease risk, and other health factors. And then there are other environmental um, monitoring that is going on, such as air pollution monitoring. So this project is extremely well-funded. Um, it has a potential for innovative outcomes and how human health can be improved in part by increasing tree canopy. For my K-12 school uh, spotlight, I wanted to talk about Mercer County Schools. So in collaboration with the Mercer County Conservation District, UK Extension, the City of Harrodsburg, and the Harrodsburg Tree Board, for the past 11 years, Mercer County High School seniors have planted an Arbor Day tree on their campus for their the first grade class. The first graders get to choose their tree from a variety of uh, native species that would grow well in the area. Then they have educational programming to learn about the tree species and planting techniques. And then on the day of the Spring Arbor Day event, local organizers and then the students participate in the ceremony and get to help plant the tree. The high school students have also engaged over the years in mulching and caring for the trees planted in the previous years. And this past year, KDF um, assisted uh, with the event and uh, celebrated our state Arbor Day with the event. For my municipality spotlight, I wanted to uh, share some work that's going on with the city of Frankfurt. In uh, 2018, the city of Frankfurt completed its initial work for the downtown tree planting plan. So the city um, hired an organization called Urban Canopy Works. This is a consulting group in Northern Kentucky to carry out a detailed inventory of the downtown trees in the area. The consultants developed a comprehensive plan that included plantable areas, tree species recommendations, cost estimates, and guidance on how to implement the plan and a stage progression over time. So the city is currently working on ways to raise and allocate funds to implement the plan over a multi-year period and while also making considerations for maintenance, staffing, and other items. For the local business spotlight, I wanted to uh, talk about a, a group called Street Cut Tree Service. Joey Hampton is a resident in Corbin, Kentucky. Um, he's a certified arborist and he's the owner of Street Cut Tree Service. And he has been instrumental in engaging with the community members and youth in his area about trees. Joey and his company have worked for years on Arbor Day programming. That's with the city, but also with the um, school district and the local college. Um, local tree planting and tree care, and doing educational programming in and around the city of Portland. In the recent years, Joey has worked um, specifically with the city of Corbin and also with the University of the Cumberlands in their Tree City USA and Tree Campus USA certification. So these are a new tree city and a new tree campus in the past couple of years, and he has been instrumental in helping them through that process, but also helping them in, implement a lot of the work that they need to carry out in order to qualify for the program. And with the corporate partner spotlight, I wanted to talk about um, Texas Roadhouse, uh, which we typically don't think of as, as uh, a business involved with tree planting. Um, but a lot of corporations have environmental initiatives um, where they either fund or provide volunteer services or both um, for, for different things, either where their corporate offices or um, in other areas. So Texas Roadhouse, has corporate office offices that are located in the Middletown area, which is outside of Louisville. And uh, they worked with Kentucky Division of Forestry and the Arbor Day Foundation and 21st Century Parks to fund and also plant trees in nearby Beckley Creek, Creek Park. Um, and that is part of the Parklands at Boys Fork area in the 21st Century Park system. So 21st Century Parks, horticulture staff, KDF staff, and the nonprofit Louisville Grows work together to plan the event, to source the trees, and then about 40 Texas Roadhouse corporate staff 
planted about 450 large containerized trees in a riparian area um, at the Beckley Creek Park for their day of service. And then separately, Louisville Groves hosted a um, Texas Roadhouse sponsored tree giveaway on a separate day. And lastly, I just wanted to touch on some Arbor Day Foundation programs that are administered across all 50 states and contribute toward a lot of the valuable work happening here around Kentucky. So these are tree focused certification programs um, that are uh, geared toward communities, campuses, utilities, and healthcare institutions. And they help encourage our partners to plant and manage trees, to allocate funding and staff for tree related work, and also to engage in public education um, programming about trees. So we have um, many tree city uh, uh, participants and tree campus participants, a couple new tree campus healthcare institutions. We are um, hoping to have some tree campus K-12 participants, which is a new program in the next year or two. And then uh, a couple of tree line uh, participants, which is public utility certification. And I wanted to mention that the city of Lexington um, has the longest uh, tree city designation, which is 33 years this year, which is really exciting. Well, thank you for sharing that presentation with us, uh, Brittany. Um, thank you. Bridget, we greatly appreciate it. And you know, it's very important for people to be able to connect with nature. Um, there's been a lot of studies out there that say, you know, for your emotional health and well-being and that kind of stuff, nature and trees just helps a, a ton. Um, and it sounds like you have a lot of a, a lot of different projects that people could actually connect with. That's right. There are small and large projects that people could engage with or um, use as models in their communities as well. So how could that one get involved in some of the projects that you have? Well, there are different organizations um, and uh, city governments and universities in, in different parts of the state that I encourage people to get involved with. Um, we have a lot of resources on our website, uh, which is the Kentucky Division of Forestry website. Um, that lists some of these resources, but also the University of Kentucky Urban Forestry, excuse me, Urban Forest Initiative um, has a lot of those partner resources. Um, it's a great starting point for people to touch base locally um, with different um, initiatives to get involved with. You know, Bridget, as we're celebrating Tree Week this week, um, it's so glad to have you. And I, it, it, to me, I think there's so many people out there in the state, especially maybe that don't live in the urban areas that are unaware of all the great work the Kentucky Division of Forestry and you are doing in this urban and community forestry program and how much effort um, is going on. And to me, it's just so important to have these urban people understand the importance of our forests and our trees and uh, what you all are doing in that program is really impressive. So um, a big thanks to you and the Division of Forestry for your efforts um, and leading these groups and communities and organizations that care for their urban forest. So it's, a, it's really cool. Thank you, Zoe. Thank you so much. We greatly appreciate you yeah. joining us today. Uh, so, yeah. Glad to be here. We'll have you back, Bridget. Thank Sounds you very good. much. See you again. Yeah, awesome. Yeah, really so, cool, Brene. Right, I know. And we, you know, we were talking about and, and saw some pictures of planting trees. And you know, it may be that you're not doing it right. So we've got, or maybe you are, but we've got two people here who can tell us exactly how to do that. Yeah, yeah definitely. It's tree week, and that yeah. means you probably want to plant a tree. And there are lots of tree giveaways going yeah. on. Mm -hmm. um, I know I was at one last weekend and there's some this weekend as well. Um, but we wanted to give you some tips on how to plant your trees and then how to take care of them. Uh, yeah. Right, Lori? Absolutely. Because I mean, once you're, you've invested in this tree and you want to make sure that you're doing it right and that it's going to it's going to survive. So, yeah, take a look. We've got a couple of videos to show you and um, very well done and not too long. So I think Ellen's going to play this. Yeah, and these are from the um, Lexington Fayette Urban County Government, um, mm -hmm. their kind of urban forestry group uh, to give you, we're going to show some proper planting tips first, and then uh, talk a little bit about that. And then we're going to show you some mulching tips, uh, because the best tree, um, if it dies after you plant it, is no good. So, <laughs> so uh, let's check out this video from LFUCG. Trees are available to purchase by bare root, in a container, or ball and burlap. Each type has its pros and cons, but this video focuses on proper planting of a tree in a container. 
First, decide where to plant. Consider things such as power lines and buildings, as well as soil conditions and light. Next, decide what tree species to plant. Select a high quality tree appropriate for the site. Consider the tree's mature size and qualities. Remember to call 811 to mark utilities before you dig. Then prepare the hole for planting. Dig a hole three to four times wider than the container and deep enough that the root flare at the base of the trunk sits slightly above ground level. The hole should be wider at the top than at the base. Once the hole is ready, prepare the tree for planting. Carefully remove the tree from the container. If the tree is stuck, tap the side of the container to help loosen it. Remove any fabric or plastic from the roots or cut the wire. If the tree is root bound, make a few cuts to help prevent the roots from choking the tree as it grows. Set the tree in the middle of the hole and ensure it is not too deep. Secure the tree with some soil, making sure it is standing up straight. Backfill the tree with the rest of the soil. Never add fertilizer, potting soil, or chemicals to your newly planted trees. Once the tree is planted, create a mulch ring. Mulch two to four inches deep around the base of the tree, but not touching the trunk. Avoid over mulching your tree or creating a mulch volcano around it. Finally, water the tree. This is especially important during the first year. Turn a hose on a slow drip in the mulch ring near the base of the tree. Soak the area for 30 to 45 minutes every two to three days during dry periods. Great. That's I a great that was... tips. Right. You know, um, Ellen, so, you know, you don't take and do those volcanoes. Is that what you're telling me? Is that wrong? Yes. Surprisingly, <laughs> as good as it looks, the mulch volcanoes are not good for the tree. No. Um, I know people love their mulch volcanoes um, and it's convenient because then you just pile a bunch of mulch and you just keep piling and keep piling. But it turns out that trees don't like that um, for a couple reasons. Mm -hmm. First, as she mentioned, you have the mulch that's touching the trunk. Um, that can be a recipe for rot because the trunk is meant to be above ground. The roots are meant to be below ground. And if the trunk's below ground, then it can kind of get a buildup of moisture, of fungi that can rot that trunk, insects that might like those conditions. So that's number one. Number two is that those roots uh, actually have to breathe. And so if you're piling a bunch of uh, kind of mulch on top of that, it can suffocate those roots. They might circle around, they might grow kind of poorly and impact the health of the tree. Mm -hmm. And Lori, you know, they, they were talking in the video about, you know, picking the tree is important. And, you know, you've done a lot of tree of the weeks on here. Um, <laughs> so they could, you, people could actually go to our website and see a lot of these trees. Yeah. And I think that's something to, to consider. A lot of times we'll go, oh, let's plant a tree. But I think you need to make a plan. You need to look at where you're, if you're looking at a yard tree, you're probably going to do a containerized tree of some description um, as opposed to a bare root seedling because it's a little more established. Um, but look at, think about why you want to plant this tree. Is it for shade? Is it to attract wildlife? Is it just like, a, I want some color in my landscape? Um, and then decide where you're putting that in that landscape. Do I, is it close to the house? Is it under another tree? Is it near a power line? So that you are picking the right tree for the right spot and for the, you know, for what you want it for. But yeah, you can always check out um, the videos. We've got about 60 of them up. Gives you some nice information about those trees, sizes, um, soils that they, they grow best in, um, if it attracts wildlife and things like that as well. But definitely make a plan before you plant for sure. You know, Laurie, that's such a good point to do that because trees are such a long-term investment, you know, and we want to make sure that we're getting it off to the right start. And, you know, you mentioned the mulch volcanoes, and it reminds me of tree topping in one way, because I think it's two examples of people doing things and they think they're doing the right thing. You know, they think they're helping the tree by reducing its crown or whatever, but um, in reality, they're not. Um, so, you know, making sure that you know what you're doing with your tree, um, not mulch volcanoing it, not topping it, you know, and planting the right tree in the right site. Those are so critical and having that good plan um, will help you do that for sure.
Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think a lot of people think like, oh, I need to trim my tree. It's, you know, right. like a like a, a, a plant in my garden or something. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and I hear, you know, oh, I'm just going to trim it a little bit. And for many of our trees, um, that trimming a little bit turns into topping, uh, which really negatively impacts trees and I think kind of counterintuitively not only do they kind of look funny in my opinion because they don't they don't quite look right um, but the the bigger problem is that people frequently do it because they think it's going to make it safer you know if they have a big branch that's overhanging something um, they're going to cut that and it'll make the tree safer but what happens is that what grows back is poorly attached and more likely to fail. So they're actually making it more dangerous in the future, more decay, so hurting the health of their tree, and I think detracting aesthetically as well. So great points. A little bit of education and a little bit of knowledge can help you overcome some of those, right? Yeah. So, and I'm sure it's just an awareness thing. You know, I'm sure most people are not intending to hurt their tree by whole volcanoing or talking. They just don't know. Um, So, so it's so good for you all to kind of share some of these good tips with them. So, and we have some more good tips. We've got one more short video on mulching that we can show. Um, That's one of the best things you can do to take care of your newly planted trees. Um, There are other things you can also do as well as some things you shouldn't do uh, that we can talk about after that video. Um, I'm going to go ahead and share that with you all and we can discuss afterwards. Mulch is a simple way to keep your trees healthy. Mulch retains soil moisture, prevents soil erosion, and regulates soil temperature. It increases organic matter as it breaks down into the soil, creating a nutrient-rich environment for growth. Mulch also allows more moisture and oxygen to reach the soil. Mulch provides a barrier from weed eaters and lawn mowers that can harm the tree. Finally, mulch helps reduce and avoid soil compaction. Though proper mulching can help your trees, improper mulching can harm them. For proper mulching, use coarse, all-natural, undyed mulch. Ensure your mulch ring extends to the drip line of the tree. Freshen mulch with one inch of mulch once or twice per year. If the mulch is already thick enough, simply turn it with a rake to prevent it from caking. Don't allow mulch to gather against the tree trunk or to pile too deeply over the roots. This will cause rot issues. That was definitely a lot of tips that that people can handle and use, so that will definitely help them when they plant their tree. Absolutely. Because like we said, you've made an investment in this tree and you want to take care of it. So um, this is a, a very easy thing to do to take care of it and prolong its life. Because like they said in the video, you're adding organic matter to that soil. So you're adding nutrients as well. So it's an, it's a natural way of taking care of your tree and it's attractive too. So I noticed they showed a lot of different mulching types. Um, is there a better mulch than others? I mean, whether the chips or... Definitely. I think the best for your tree, your tree would be happiest with really coarse ground uh, chips, um, not too deep and kind of regularly applying that. And uh, from the tree's perspective, taking it all the way out to the drip line, you know, as far out as the canopy sends. Now, practically, and for a lot of people's kind of gardening sensibilities, that might not fit with what they want to do. Um, but I think the the principle there being that the mulch around the tree, it's organic, so it's going to break down, it's going to build the soil, it's going to create the right habitat for those roots to grow. It's also going to prevent mower damage and trimmer damage. Uh-huh. And yeah, <laughs> which is very important. You see that and, so much. <laughs> unfortunately, <laughs> trees and turf do not need the same things. And so if you're trying to grow really lush turf right under your tree, it's kind of a recipe for, you know, one of those things not being happy, either the turf or the tree. So if you put a mulch kind of a ring around there, you're going to just kind of eliminate that problem. Now, there are other types of mulch. Um, there are inorganic mulches that you might see or, or people putting uh, kind of stones or other things around there. Um, those aren't going to help you build the soil as much. Um, they might still protect it from mower and string trimmer damage, but uh, kind of from the health of the tree, it's going to be best to have that nice coarse um, uh, wood chips or mulch. Mm-hmm. You know, a lot of people like to put that landscaping stuff and then put mulch down. So that's not a good idea. 
You know, I don't necessarily recommend that. Um, I think on the one hand, some of that can be, you know, permeable and water can get through, uh, but it's also going to be more of a challenge for the tree's roots. Uh, they're not going to have access to the, the perfect conditions for them, and uh, that might hold moisture in in ways that aren't going to be ideal. Yep. Now, it can be a really useful tool when you're just getting trees started, um, uh, but I really recommend if you're planting a tree and, and you don't need to go out and buy that stuff, uh, just use some cardboard that you might yep. have sitting around, put cardboard around, kind of even you can put it right on the turf uh, <laughs> if you have that. Yep, uh, put it there. Always did. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and then you can put mulch on top of that. It's it's kind of a easier and I think better in the long term because that cardboard will break down yeah. mm -hmm. instead of having that plastic material in there so yeah we did yeah. get a question is the recycled tire type of mulch harmful to landscapes you know I, I think it's it's not beneficial in the same way that using an organic material would be. Um, it does not build the soil. Uh, it can, I mean, it's, you're basically putting trash in your, your yard um, it, to some extent, you know, uh, but um, it's, it still would give the protection of, um, against mower damage and trimmer damage. And I know that there are some areas where, like, let's say right next to the hospital, they do use inorganic materials because they don't want people tracking in mud and other things like that. So I think that there are cases where you might use it. Um, mm -hmm. I know that it's, it's popular in different settings, but it's not going to build up the soil in the same way that, that benefits your trees. Absolutely. <clears throat> So not a one size fits all. Now we talked about mulching. Um, also remember for newly planted trees, you want to water them, make sure they get enough water. Um, not too much water, however. Uh, so they don't need to be watered every day like you would your garden plants, you know, a little sprinkle of the hose every day. Um, trees like to be watered deeply, uh, but then have an opportunity to not necessarily dry out, but not have that moisture held um, on them. So a newly planted tree, if you think about it, probably its root system is pretty compromised. And that's what trees use to, to feed themselves and to give themselves water. Uh, so so um, they, they need to be getting more water than you might expect. Once those trees are established, they might not need to be watered as regularly. But if we are in a drought period, consider maybe putting your hose on a trickle and letting it um, water those trees over a longer period of time. They also have soaker hoses and tree watering bags that you could use instead of just giving it a little sprinkle, uh, which is not gonna benefit your trees uh, necessarily. Um, other kind of things that you could do, uh, a question that I get a lot is, do I need to fertilize my newly planted trees? Yeah, Lori, you want to talk about that? Well, no, yeah, you, that's not, and you can probably explain it better, but um, definitely you're trying to get this tree established and you don't want to dump a bunch of fertilizer on there because it does change the chemistry in the soil and it can actually even, I think, burn some of that root system, which you're really trying to get established. But if you'd like to speak a little bit more to that, uh, that was sure. one of those questions we always got, do, do I want to fertilize it? And like, nope, not right away. You do not want to not fertilize it. Not right away. <laughs> and for most most of our trees, um, you know, trees need their roots to get nutrients and to get water. And the major limiting factor for newly planted trees is that root system. And you want to encourage that root system so that then the tree can kind of support that growth in the above ground part, the part that you see and care about, but the underground part is really key. Um, and so what they need for that is the right conditions for the roots. Trees can feed themselves. Our native trees, they photosynthesize. That gives them their energy. Um, they can feed themselves. And typically, nutrients are not a limiting factor um, for many of our trees. Now, this depends. It depends on where you are and your soil. So it's always a good idea to get your soils tested. But for most of our trees and landscape settings, nutrients aren't the limiting factor. Um, so you don't need to fertilize them. Fertilizing them can encourage putting on new shoot growth uh, when the tree really should be putting on new root growth, especially mm -hmm. for those newly planted trees. So one less thing you have to do. Yep. That's always good, right? <laughs> <laughs> Oh, oh, we appreciate both of you all helping us get these trees started on, right and, um, you know, growing right and um, helping people make good informed decisions. So, um, you know, again, if you're going to make the investment in a tree, you want to make sure you're doing it right and it's going to survive. So we did get one question that just popped in and says, how do you successfully plant seedlings in a forest when you have problems with deer? <laughs> well, 
and that's a good question. Planting seedlings in a forest is going to be totally different yes, from it, in the landscape setting. Billy, did you want to talk a little bit well, about that? Uh, what I would say is, you know, um, there's a lot of reasons why you might want to do that, but recognizing the challenges when you're competing against established trees with established root systems, putting little seedlings in there is really challenging and really hard for those seedlings to get it. So it's going to take a lot of work and it's going to take a lot of effort. And if deer are there, you're going to have to exclude the deer from them. So they make um, tree shelters and tree tubes. Um, if it's a larger planting area, you're probably looking at fencing, um, you know, probably at least eight feet high um, and solid all around that planting. So they do that commonly in Pennsylvania and other areas where they have so much deer pressure, they basically have to put exclusions in there. So um, it is a challenging area, but you can get them started with some tree tubes and tree shelters. Those are reasonable and um, they can get that tree off to a good start, um, but you're going to have to kind of monitor that and kind of move it um, with that tree a little bit as it grows. Otherwise, it's just going to be a little buffet um, for the deer. And when I think of planting trees in a forest, uh, I think a lot of people think like, oh, that's what they want to do. They want to plant trees. But um, our forests are for the most part naturally regenerating. So we have lots of um, seed and seedlings there, but the challenge is, are those what you want necessarily? Maybe, maybe not. Um, but uh, is there enough light that if you were to plant those seedlings, they would grow up or would they just kind of hang out and wait for that right opportunity? Because if you have a lot of big trees, they may, the, the limiting factor for them might be light. Um, so it just depends. And uh, if somebody's interested in that, what would you recommend, Billy? I would say you really probably need to work with a professional, somebody that can get out there, can evaluate that site and let you know what's appropriate, right? The other thing is, is same for uh, landscape planning. You want to plant the right tree in the right spot. Um, so making sure you're selecting appropriate trees for that area, um, trees that will have a chance to be successful. I um, mean, that typically often be trees that would commonly grow in that area, whether they're now or not. Um, but working with a professional, they'll know that. They'll also be able to give you some of those tips on how to try to ensure that tree's success. Um, going forward. So um, yeah, working with a professional is going to be probably your best chance of having success in that situation. And that's a good point. And in, in each of these systems and with different types of trees, you might do things slightly differently. If you've got a bare root tree from a, a tree giveaway, you know, there are going to be some things that you could do slightly differently than if you bought a container grown tree or a really big bald and burlap tree. Um, so if, as you start to approach this, there is lots of great information for you online. Uh, make sure to check out fact sheets from the University of Kentucky and other organizations um, and videos like these ones that we showed today from LFUCG yep. and uh, a little bit of research I think will go a long way in giving you a healthy tree into the future. No doubt. And your local county extension agents can be a great resource for connecting you to additional support and help as well. So um, don't forget about that. Definitely. Oh, Lori, Ellen, thank you so much for joining uh, us today on the show. Thanks yeah. yeah. for having us on. Yeah. Yeah. Go trees. Tree <laughs> trees. <laughs> trees are the answer. I firmly believe that. Um, all right. No matter what the question, right? That's right. <laughs> trees are the answer. So speaking of being the answer, you know, we use trees for a wide variety of uses, right? From exactly. um, habitat, um, for, for beauty, liking to see them, fruit. Um, but we also like some of the wood products that our trees supply. And, um, you know, next week, um, we're going into a new week. So this is tree week, and we're glad to celebrate that but next week we've got a, a new week related to trees that we're going to be celebrating and we have our very own Chad Nyman here to tell us a little bit about what's going on with that. Thank you Billy and Renee. As you all were saying this is tree week and uh, some wonderful information uh, to help folks with making good decisions on tree planting and, and caring for those trees uh, but starting Sunday coming up this next week so October 17th through the 23rd is Forest Products Week, and it's a great opportunity for us to be able to celebrate all those great benefits that our trees and forests provide. And so just a little bit of history on National Forest Products Week. In 1960, Congress designated the third week of October to be National Forest Products Week. And so our, our renewable forests and the products that we extract are so important that all standing presidents and many governors of individual states on both sides of the political aisle have made proclamations since. And so just to give an idea for what these proclamations look like, uh, there's some information there about forests and 
those different uh, environmental as well as wood products that come out of those forests and talks about for Kentucky specifically here, this is Andy Bashir's deck uh, proclamation and he talks about, you know, the 12.4 million acres of forests that cover nearly half of Kentucky and those huge economic contributions that those forests contribute, as well as clean air and clean water. And so why do we celebrate National Forest Products Week? And so we want to recognize those many values of forests and the products they create. It also acknowledges the value of woodlands and commitment to good stewardship and conservation practices that help responsibly manage those forests. And so this week's theme is forests and forest products for all. And so healthy, productive forests are critically important for a renewable economy while renewably creating products all people need while improving the health and that quality of life for all people in our nation. And so forests for all is the theme for the Society of American Foresters National Convention uh, that's going to be going on this year. And so building on that theme that they've got uh, with foresters bridging that gap between the urban forests that you heard some from Bridget about today and the rural, uh, you know, large natural forests that we have and how all of those forests benefit our lives and, and all people. And so I wanted to mention that Society of American Foresters meeting and, and some of how uh, we're promoting this Forest Products Week this year and trying to tie that together with foresters and wood products. And so some of the activities you know, how we're celebrating Forest Products Week on UK campus. Uh, October 18th, which will be Monday, we'll have some activities going on on the front lawn of the Thomas Poe Cooper Forestry Building. So that's the corner of Rose and Hubelet there on campus. Uh, there's gonna be a scavenger hunt of prominent wood products around campus. And on the next slide, I'll have uh, that website where you can go and be able to see the different locations and different items around campus. At 10.55 a.m., we're gonna have a reading of the governor's proclamation there on the lawn. And we'll follow that immediately with a cookout and we'll serve free hot dogs and veggie dogs. And that'll be for the entire campus community. And so that'll start at 11, directly following that proclamation. And we'll also have some prizes for that forest products scavenger hunt. And so, uh, from 11 to 1 p.m. will be the time when you can come and claim those prizes. And they are very nice, locally made. Uh, they're laser engraved keychains. And we also have 15 bookmarks as well. They're made out of soft maple, so uh, red maple. And uh, so we'll be having you take a picture of yourself or a selfie, as they call it, uh, four of the locations listed on the uh, that website that you can see above for Forest Products Week scavenger hunt. And so you'll bring those pictures and show them to your friends, Renee Williams and Billy Thomas. Uh, those are the From the Woods Today co-hosts. And so they will be located out there in the middle of the activity on the front lawn of the Thomas Bo Cooper building. And that is again at the corner of Rose and Hugel if they're on campus. And they'll be there from 11 to one and that'll be again on Monday, October 18th. And so uh, just to go a little bit into forest products and, and what it means to be renewable, uh, it's important that the resource is not depleted and that the forest growth offsets removals in Kentucky, we're growing twice as many trees as what we remove it from harvest. And one factor that is really incredible with our hardwood forests is that they are naturally regenerating from stump sprouts and from seed. And so there's this natural regeneration that occurs. And so for all of this to happen and be renewable, it requires that that growing space is not being developed and converted into other land uses and that those woods are protected from invading insects, plants and disease that Ellen Crocker, Dr. Crocker uh, tells us about and provides some great information on. And so I can't help myself but putting this slide up here, uh, that old saying of reduce, reuse, recycle and positive choices that we can all make. And uh, a lot of times forest products uh, do have many benefits compared to alternatives. And I think it's important to think about, you know, where our wood and forest products come from 
And the simple answer is that they come from our forests. Uh, but trying to tie that together, uh, you know, very common things through extension and, and uh, general food understanding, uh, these farm to table initiatives have been wonderful in trying to explain, you know, where our food comes from. And so these woods to goods programs that have been going on have been uh, really helpful in connecting that from the woods to the finished products type of information and uh, really highlighting local wood usage and general awareness to supply chains and manufacturing that we all rely upon. And uh, local and regional supply chains, they really do allow for more value added to products and they provide employment, which I'll talk about more towards the end. And so wood products, they're really all over in our homes, schools and offices. And so I've got a few images here, just you know, a framed home, hardwood flooring of oak here, a front door made of uh, some oak and some hickory cabinets, oak stair treads and stair rails and tissue products that we use daily. So many things that are in our homes, schools and offices. But thinking into the innovation of wood, one of our oldest materials, um, wood really is the future in multi-story construction and one of those types of mass timber is cross laminated timber. So right now, uh, most of that is softwoods and that's you know due to the building code. So we're talking spruce, pine and fir, uh, but any type of wood can be used as long as it has a structural grade stamp on it. And so we get a lot of questions from folks who may have a bandsaw mill or wanna purchase wood locally, as long as they get that wood graded by a, Southern Inspection Bureau or Nelma Inspector, they can be able to have that stamp on that wood and use that structurally in their home. And so trying to promote this idea of using more wood and building, it has the ability to have carbon storage in that wood. And a rough estimate is about 50% of that dry weight of that wood is carbon. And so there is this reduced environmental impact compared to alternative building materials that we traditionally think of in our large buildings. There is a faster construction timeline that's been pretty well documented with these pre-made wooden panels that can be placed with a crane and a small crew. And uh, wood has, it is an insulate material. It has the potential to reduce urban heat sink and uh, improve resilience from earthquakes, explosion, and that ability to char in a fire situation. I will say that the demand for these CLT panels far outpaces the production that we have currently. And so a large portion, about 40 to 50% of the panels that are being used in these mass timber buildings now are being imported from Europe and British Columbia, Canada. And so we're seeing more of these plants coming online and due to some really great work that has gone on at Virginia Tech, West Virginia and some other universities, um, hardwoods are starting to integrate into that CLT cross laminated timber discussion and, and it very well may, may be possible to be able to select those panels in the very near future. Just to highlight that there is a, a abundance of resources for folks that are looking at designing a wooden structure or may be wanting to learn more about that and so woodworks is filling that niche. They're funded through the Softwood Lumber Board and the U.S. Forest Service, USDA, as well as uh, the forest investment. And so just to go into a few other ways that these forests contribute to our lives, there are so many forest foods that are really incredible. And so the persimmon, as you might see, is coming ripe about now. Uh, there's some that are still not quite there, but I've tasted and found some that are already and not bitter anymore. That's a bad experience if you get one that is still very astringent. But uh, maple syrup, uh, Billy Thomas and, and others in our department are really working to promote the great folks who are making maple syrup locally, provide that local sugar. Uh, but there's so many great other things like pawpaws and uh, giant hickory nuts and walnuts morel mushrooms, other mushrooms that can be cultivated on wood. 
so many great forest foods and a food that you may not think of typically, uh, bourbon, whiskey, wine, and spirits aged in white oak barrels uh, are forest products. And so new charred white oak barrel or cask as it is called, uh, they're required by federal law for bourbon. And so 95% of bourbon is made in Kentucky, which makes it a great local value added product for our state. And so that's about approximately $10 billion of wood aged or matured spirits to the Kentucky economy. So a huge contribution. And 70% uh, of that flavor and all of the color imparted to that bourbon is from the charred and toasted white oak. But I can't help but mention that wood provides a variety of musical instruments and uh, they really do enhance our lives and culture. Just very enjoyable, uh, the impact that the tone of those woods can make. But recreation, there's so many types of recreation in our life that are made with forest products, uh, different sports equipment, but also just being out in those forests, you know, enjoying your personal land or the wonderful public lands that we have in Kentucky and the surrounding region and uh, enjoying all of those benefits. And so I said that I would talk a little bit about that economic contribution. And so this is just from Kentucky's for us uh, from 2020. We know that there's about nine and a half billion in direct economic contribution. And when you look at all of the other contributions from that industry, it's about $14 billion in total economic contribution from the Kentucky forest sector. And so we know 27,000 jobs directly to the forest sector, and that supports a total of 53,000 jobs overall. And so we do have the link down here for the economic contribution report, but it can be found pretty easily by typing in UKY Kentucky Forest Sector Economic Report or by visiting our website. I'd like to encourage you if you wanna learn more about forest health, forest management, forest products and other woodland resources to check out that UK, that forestry and natural resources extension page there. You gave us lots of reasons yeah. to celebrate trees, man. Exactly. That was great. Absolutely. Wonderful. So many great reasons. I don't think you actually realize how much wood affects you daily um, and how much you actually, you know, touch it and are around it and that kind of thing. Um, I know you showed several great examples of, of things that uh, forests and, and wood and trees have to do with our daily lives. Absolutely. We do take it for granted, but our forests and our trees are incredible. They're always working out there for us. We got to take care of them as well. Right, exactly. exactly. Yeah, nice word. So, so make sure if you're around Lexington, come out and join us on Monday, and um, we'd be happy to get you a hot dog or a veggie dog and help celebrate um, Forest Products Week next week. Billy Absolutely. and I will be out there doing things like that. <laughs> <laughs> you can give us some ideas for the show. <laughs> we look forward to having everybody come out. All right. All right. Thanks, Chad. Uh, we appreciate you being yeah. on. Yeah, great segment, Chad. Thank you, buddy. All right. All right. Cool. So you know, we've learned a lot, you know, but, you know, Billy, you've got a, a webinar coming up. We do. We've got actually got a couple of quick little webinars wanted to mention. Um, Tree Week is continuing this week. You know, we as um, UK Forestry and Natural Resource Extension are um, continuing with Tree Week. And um, tomorrow we have a webinar on Maple Syrup Project, the Kentucky Maple Syrup Project, and what we're trying to do with that. So Dr. Jacob Muller and myself will be on talking about um, that project and how people can get involved with that, um, what we're doing with Maple Syrup here in Kentucky. Um, but the other one I wanted to mention is tomorrow evening, and I'll share my screen real quick, Renee on that one and I will drop it in the chat pod as well um, but we've got a couple of maple syrup workshops coming up um, and we've got one tomorrow night at from 7 to 8 30 in the evening so you can register here and I will drop this link in the chat pod um, here in just a second but please join us um, coming up tonight for the maple syrup toolbox so if you join us at noon tomorrow um, you'll learn about maple syrup and its production and, the, and all of that um, and then if you're thinking you might 
might be interested in getting involved in the production of it or wanting to understand how that happens, um, then join us tomorrow evening as well. So there is a little quick registration you'll have to do on that, um, but I will go ahead and share that in the chat pod right now with everybody so you can um, join us if you like, but we sure hope that you will. Uh, maple syrup is a sweet prod product and it is um, really tasty and we've got a lot of maple trees here in Kentucky. So um, it's something cool. we're trying to bring together. Um, right. We and you know, we're not done with Tree Week. Ellen's got two more uh, yeah. webinars that she's doing this uh, week on Tree Week. And yeah. she can mention a little bit about that. Well, and it's not even me. This is from our forestry and natural resources extension team. Mm -hmm. So tomorrow, uh, Billy and Jacob will be talking about that maple syrup uh, project at uh, noon. And you can sign up. Uh, we'll put the link in the chat. Um, and then Friday, uh, Matt Springer will be talking about wildlife and trees. Um, and in addition, I've got a couple in-person Tree Week related programs here in Lexington. Uh, tonight at six in Wellington Park, we'll be doing some invasive plant identification and talking about management. And then tomorrow morning at Master Sensation, we'll be doing some of that management. So if you want to get your hands dirty with some invasive plant work, uh, please come join us. Wonderful. Celebrate Tree Week. Lots yes, of opportunities. Lots of, lots of opportunities. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. And I think we made a compelling case for why you should. So, right. Bridget, right. great job. Thank you again. Good to see everybody. Yeah. Um, so I think that's about all we have for today and yeah. we greatly appreciate um, everyone joining us and again if you have any ideas for the show you can easily just uh, get on uh, from the woods today.com and we will be there to answer any questions that you have yeah big thanks see y'all next week thank you bye